Do you feel a little bit more confident about doing Lewis structures at this point for things that conform to the Gooch math? Yes. As long as they conform to the Gooch math, it's pretty easy. I love the fact that there is something that will mathematically tell me, thank you, um, how many bonds to make. Um, yes, the miracle of Gooch math, the miracle that something will actually mathematically tell you how many bonds there is. Hallelujah! Now, let's talk about why there are the number of bonds there are. So, this is where I always felt like, until, until I think I had a better grip on it myself, I felt like I had been lied to, to some degree. And honestly, a lot of continuing to learn in any subject feels like that, because we tend to simplify things to start with. And then, oh yeah, then we tell you the truth, which is always more complicated. So, we, uh, we did these little orbital things, if you recall. Ah! And, you know, we have little um, adorable little s orbitals and these cute little p orbitals, right? So if two things were just bonding on their p orbitals, how many p orbitals are there? On any, upper, on any energy level? Three. Three p orbitals. If things were just bonding on their s's, how many s orbitals are there on any energy level? One. Two electrons in it. Yeah. One s orbital. So, how do we get something like, how do we get something like methane? We've got things coming off this in four directions. What the heck, people? So remember, bonding is typically happening in the valence electrons, and the valence are typically S and P. So, okay, I get that there are four potential orbitals. You've got one S, you've got three P's. Four potential orbitals, but shouldn't shouldn't it not do this? Huh. So what happens, oddly enough, is we see this thing called orbital hybridization. So the orbitals sort of split the difference, and S and P orbitals actually merge into these hybrid orbitals. So instead of the P being higher energy at that point than the S, what you get is this hybrid orbital that's actually equal energy. So this happens in a couple different ways. We get things where, let me shrink this down, we get things where we merge 1s and 1p. We get things where we merge 1s and 2p's, and we even get things where we sort of merge 1s and all 3p's. Crazy. So this, the end product is two orbitals. We start with two orbitals, we end with two orbitals. But we no longer have an s and a p orbital, we have an sp orbital. Ugh. When we do this, we start with three orbitals, we end with three orbitals, but we no longer have an S, 1S and 2P orbitals, we now have an SP2 orbital. We're naming it for the ingredients that went into the cookies, so to speak. When we have this, and this is one of my favorites, I, I, I love methane, I think it's awesome. Um, we, we merge these four together, we end up with four orbitals, equal energy orbitals, and we call it an sp3. You're going to see this again. So now, instead of this s and these little globby p's, you get an s plus a p and you get this thing. This weird asymmetrical looking thing. And you get the same thing on each of the three axes that the p's exist on. But obviously, we have something that's kind of sticking out into space here, too, or we couldn't have that. Peculiar. Peculiar indeed. <clears throat> this is actually what allows for the geometry that you're seeing. And let me get the right side here. Linear. So what we get with SPs are linear molecules. It's a straight line. You get one S, one P, you mush them together, you get one orbital that will hang out to one side and we can get a linear molecule. 
<clears throat> if you imagine merging three orbitals into places to merge, that allows you to have a trigonal planar molecule. And if you imagine merging four orbitals so that they stick out in every single direction, then what we get is that tetrahedral arrangement. That's actually the result of an sp3 hybridization. It's kind of cool. It doesn't explain, however, the weirdness into which we are about to wade, because, you know, it's the last day before break. We might as well make it weird. We have people in gingerbread pants. We have people with funny ears. We have people in elf costumes. Why wouldn't it be weird? I'm wearing bells all over the place. Of course it's going to be weird. Yay. We, we see why we can have four orbitals sticking out. We can get a tetrahedron. What if you were given this compound? And I assure you, this compound actually exists. Sulfur hexafluoride. It's one sulfur atom. Six fluorine atoms. Covalently bonded. So I'd like you to just draw the Lewis dot structures for each individual thing. Don't try the Lewis diagram yet. Just draw the, Lew or the Lewis dot diagram. Don't try the structure yet. You got something that looks like that? Awesome. Well, it's really super easy to see how we can bond a fluorine right there. Yeah? And we'll just replace that, those shared electrons with a line, hey, fluorine's happy, sulfur's happy, yippee ki -yay. And we can obviously stick another fluorine right there. Boom, boom. Everybody's happy. Are we done? Oh, dear Lord, no. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Gesundheit. How on earth do we stick four more? Are you serious? Four more fluorines there? The gooch map doesn't work. No, it doesn't. These are the nonconformers. So, what do you know about fluorine? What is true of fluorine? Think about it in terms of its hogginess for electrons. What do we call its greed for electrons? Electronegativity. What do we know about fluorine? It is the most electronegative element there is. The halogens in general are pretty electronegative. Fluorine is so electron greedy that this compound actually forms as follows. Whoa, okay, that's crazy. There we go. We get S. F, 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 F. F. F, one, two, three, four, five, six. Boom, 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 boom. Whoops, boom. Boom, 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 Two, four, six, eight. Fluorine's happy. 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 Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Now let's count sulfur. Two, four, six, eight. Ten, twelve? What the heck? How is that possible? It's possible because fluorine is so electronegative that it actually pulls electrons into bonding that aren't even true valence electrons in the sulfur. It is so powerfully hungry for electrons that it, it pulls away what would be van happily paired valence electrons, and so we end up with this craziness. Now, it does not meet the octet map. but count the number of valence electrons you had going in. So by, by my math, we should have 48 valence electrons. Go ahead and take a moment and count the number of valence electrons present there. 
Did you get 48? You should. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 46, 48. For these non-conformers, they don't meet the, the octet rule. They violate the octet rule. Good? Okay. But when you figure out the structure, it's going to represent all the valence electrons you know you should have. So they're a little bit weird. The thing to remember is the more electronegative elements that are pairing with something else will pull electron cloud. So these fluorines pull essentially the blankets, pull the electron cloud away from the sulfur. So despite the fact that the sulfur is really surrounded by what should feel like 12 bonding electrons, it's fine. It survives because the fluorine is pulling so much of the electron cloud away from it. With that, I'm going to have you go ahead and get started on these. There is no Gooch math table for, for the nonconformers because the Gooch math doesn't work. So this is where you'll have, you will still have to add up the number of valence electrons you've got, but you can't do Gooch math. Okay? That's, we'll pause there.